Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and features spoilers. So, cards on the table, I didn't really want to make a video about the rise of Skywalker. I really, really disliked this movie. And I kind of knew that while I was on Christmas break, a lot of my complaints would be covered in like a hundred other video essays. The movie's story is a mess. It feels cobbled together at the last minute in a desperate attempt to please everyone, which is never really a good plan. Basically, I just saw it as a letdown in pretty much every way possible. I was ready to just leave it alone and move on to stuff that I wanted to talk about more. But now, weeks after release, one thing continues to really annoy me. Something that has been talked about, sure, but I don't think it's been explored as much as it deserves to. So this week, I'm going to talk about Finn, his journey in the sequel trilogy, and how The Rise of Skywalker brutally lets this character down. Star Wars Electronic Lightsabers. Which side will you choose? The side of Anakin Skywalker? Coming out of The Force Awakens, I really thought that Finn was the most promising hero character of the new cast. Nothing against Daisy Ridley or Oscar Isaac, but future Jedi and hotshot pilot were archetypes that we'd already seen in Star Wars movies. Finn was something new. A stormtrooper with a conscience who could no longer go along with the First Order just mowing down innocent people. One of the most striking images from that first movie is the helmet with a blood-stained hand on it. It's a small touch, but it might be one of the smartest things Abram ever did in these movies. It's pretty powerful imagery, makes the beginning of Finn's arc clear, and on the most basic level, it just lets us keep track of which Stormtrooper Finn is before he takes off the helmet. But here's the thing about a Stormtrooper making that moral choice to leave the First Order and join the Resistance. If you're gonna go that route and acknowledge that under the helmets, these are real people with feelings, beliefs, and their own motivations, you really have to commit to that. And to me, Star Wars never really did that. They opened a huge can of worms with the Finn character, even going so far as to say that a lot of the stormtroopers are basically fighting against their own will. I think that's interesting, but these movies only acknowledge it in fits and starts. We see an entire faction of former stormtroopers in Rise of Skywalker, but that doesn't stop the movies from treating most of them like the disposable droids of the prequels, or make our heroes second guess even for a second, killing them by the dozen. I'm not saying that Star Wars needed to become a franchise that really thinks through the morality of this stuff, but if you're going to introduce a character like Finn, I think you kind of owe it to the audience to take that seriously. And not just pick and choose which stormtroopers get to count as real people and which can just be killed off in a gag. To me, that's lazy writing. Then there's The Last Jedi, which it's safe to say is like my least favorite movie to talk about online, but I guess I'll do it anyway. I remember being pretty underwhelmed by Finn's role in the film. It felt a little undercooked to me, and like many out there, I kind of rolled my eyes at a lot of the casino planet. But re-watching it after The Rise of Skywalker, I gotta say, I think it at least treats Finn better than this movie. Which granted, maybe isn't the highest bar to clear. At the start of The Last Jedi, Finn is hyper-focused on finding Rey. The rest of the Resistance clearly doesn't matter to him that much yet. Now you could say this is because he was deeply in love or whatever, but I'm not really convinced. I think Finn just found the first thing resembling a family with Poe, Rey, and Han, and was terrified of losing that. Over the course of the movie though, he gets a much broader view of the universe and why the Resistance matters so much, to the point where he's willing to sacrifice himself for it. Now you can say that was executed well or really poorly, but at least it's like something resembling a character arc for him, which I don't think Rise of Skywalker can even say. What does Finn do in Episode 9? If I was talking about purely a plot level, there is some stuff that I can point to. In the final battle, he leads the charge, his force sensitivity proves useful to finding stuff a few times, and there's probably some other examples. But in terms of the stuff that really matters, the character changing or growing in some way, there's just not that much there. The most talked about thing surrounding Finn in this movie is what he didn't do. Namely, telling Rey whatever he was going to say before they fell into the cave. 
a lot of people thought that he was going to say he loved her, and then Abrams came out and was like, no, actually it's just that he's force sensitive, which doesn't really make that much sense to me because I don't see why he wouldn't just tell her that, but whatever. The truth is that it's just kind of pathetic that this is what people are talking about when it comes to Finn after his final movie. Not anything he did in the story or a surprising change in the character. Nope, just what he maybe would have said in a scene that is probably just sitting on the cutting room floor. And it makes sense that that's what we're left talking about, because Finn just has barely anything interesting to do here. But of course, I need to talk about Janna and her band of deserter stormtroopers. I like this concept. Actually, I'd go even farther than that and say that I think this might be the most interesting idea in this jumbled rehash of a movie. But like pretty much all of the new characters introduced in the film, Janna seems half-baked and underwritten with everything we know about her shoved into a single scene or two. And that's really disappointing, because it's with the introduction of these former stormtroopers that I think Finn's story could have really added up to something great. We're missing some emotional beats here that could have been really, really good. Like maybe while Poe and most of the Resistance are fine with just blowing away First Order soldiers, Finn passionately argues that they should be given a chance to desert. By the rise of Skywalker, he could be the leader of this growing movement, and maybe instead of having some ships show up to save the day at the end, you know, like in this and plenty of other Star Wars movies, the stormtroopers put down their weapons and just refuse to fight. But something like that would require life under the First Order to be more fleshed out, and to give us a better sense of what these soldiers' lives are really like. And those kind of details and backstory on the First Order have just been almost completely ignored by this sequel trilogy. I mean, really, you have to go to the comics and novels to even get a decent understanding of who they are and where they came from. The sequel trilogy never bothered to put in the work to make this feel like a real oppressive regime. So of course it's hard to care about this band of stormtrooper deserters. And for Fenn, I think there's one huge missed opportunity. Captain Phasma. This could have been a character that meant something. That embodied everything Fenn wanted to leave behind by ditching the First Order. In The Last Jedi, they bring her back to fight Finn to the death, and it was such a waste. She was never allowed to be a character. She's a video game boss, and when she died in very video game boss fashion, it ended any chance she had of actually becoming an interesting villain for Finn. Instead of spouting the usual bad guy cliche dialogue, I really wish she would have been written to really hone in on Finn's insecurities. In a way, Phasma knows Fenn better than his own friends do. She knows how he was raised, how he lived most of his life, and the type of propaganda he was fed growing up. I would have loved to see her use that to her advantage over the course of these three movies. To try to convince Fenn that someone like him, a man who previously had no name and no real identity, could never make a life for himself outside of the First Order. Maybe we'd get to see Finn having difficulty adjusting to his newfound freedom, and struggling to deal with the trauma he's been left with. That is the Finn and Phasma story I want to see, but it's exactly the kind of thing that Rise of Skywalker, with its obsessive breakneck pacing, where we can't stop to breathe for five minutes unless it's to worship some original series character, would never give us. Because to do that, Abrams and company would have to see their characters as people not devices just to get us to the next set piece. So yeah, in the end, I've never been more disappointed in a Star Wars movie than I was by the end of Rise of Skywalker. Say what you will about the prequel series, and believe me, I know there's plenty to say. I think Revenge of the Sith was a more satisfying and focused conclusion than this by a mile. And even though the George Lucas dialogue can be very clunky and forced, at least it tries to earn its most emotional moments in a way that this film never does. I loved Attack the Block, and I think John Boyega is a really promising actor. But what he was given to play in this movie feels like a hollow afterthought, and Finn deserved better. They introduced something genuinely interesting with that character, but could never be bothered to dig any deeper. And when I think of my problems with the Disney Star Wars films, the first thing that comes to mind won't be the half-assed Palpatine return or the lack of meaningful world building, it'll be this character. But if you're a sci-fi fan like me and want to kind of wash the taste of that out of your mouth, check out The Mystery of Dark Energy on CuriosityStream. 
This documentary dives into some scientific research that undermines some of Einstein's theories in a mind-blowing way. And if you have even a casual interest in space, it's definitely worth a watch. On Curiosity Stream, you'll find docs on science, history, tech, and a ton more. So that's the place to go for documentaries. But that's not all you'll get. By signing up for their annual membership, you'll also be getting Nebula, a streaming service made by independent creators like Lindsay Ellis, Just Right, Tierzoo, and me. The library on there is always growing, and it's a way for YouTubers to create original stuff outside of YouTube itself. So you can support a lot of independent creators and get tons of documentaries just by signing up for their annual membership. Just $19.99 for the entire year. Get access to all of that and a free trial by going to curiositystream.com slash Captain Midnight, which you'll find in the description and pinned comment below. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started, because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.